Um, so uh, kind of like I was alluding to, uh, the focus of my work is going to be postoperative pain management with metamazole. And uh, we, we were specific to orthopedic surgery. Um, we conducted a systematic review. Um, but if we can move to the next slide, I can kind of get back into some of this uh, historical information as well, kind of the learnings that we had traveling abroad. So um, so obviously opioids are incredibly effective uh, for acute pain control, particularly which is of critical importance in the perioperative setting, uh, particularly for orthopedic surgery. Anytime we're dealing with trauma or dealing with um, significant orthopedic surgery, uh, the pain control can be, you know, it's one of the foremost uh, kind of critical things for us to consider in the perioperative period not only for patient comfort, but also to facilitate rehabilitation, allow them to be able to engage in the PT and the OT that we know is so critical to their recovery from any sort of significant procedure. Um, and, uh, but importantly, you know, opioids live in this space where, you know, we, we also have this additional challenge um, with overdose, overdose deaths, particularly in our country. So um, if you can see, I'll kind of walk us through that figure in the top right and kind of delineating, this is great data that came out of the CDC, um, and national vital statistics, uh, a figure that I found really helpful. So we have kind of three distinct waves of the opioid crisis. So the first wave being right around the 1990s. So this is right in that era where MS cotton uh, is is released by Purdue Pharmaceuticals as well as OxyContin. Um, so those were kind of 1986 and 1984 respectively. And that's when we first start to notice a significant amount of over or, or of overdose deaths, specifically from prescription opiates. And then Later on, almost you know, closer to the mid, uh, kind of early 2000s, 2010 era, we're seeing a kind of a second wave where we start to become more acutely aware of this transition from prescription pharmaceuticals uh, in the setting of opiates to patients then uh, finding themselves using um, heroin and other um, opiate-like substances, other opioids, um, and having significant rise in, uh, in this transition from having a pers uh, medical prescription for an opiate and then ending up using heroin and potentially overdose on heroin. And now um, we're in this third wave, uh, scarier wave um, that is dominated by these uh, synthetic opiates that we're seeing now that, you know, are also just kind of have been mixed into, you know, basically every drug we can imagine, um, you know, that's of foremost concern. So when we take a step back and think about what we can do in the setting of this crisis, um, particularly in the setting of perioperative surgery, um, like I talked about in orthopedic surgery is really thinking about are there ways that we can manage pain without potentially risking a patient going from that legitimate medical prescription into use with uh, any sort of other opiate or, you know, uh, and then coming into contact with these synthetic op opioids. Um, and additionally, there was a more recent study that I don't have re reference on this slide um, by Butler at all. Uh, I think this was in er early 2021, it got published, um, looking at you know, we have a lot of good information about long-term opioid use and, and the risk for addiction, but we're actually seeing more information now coming out about short acute use um, in the legitimate medical uh, context and then uh, risk for addiction. So this was a study that came out, they looked at, they pulled people that were initially exposed to medical opiates in the emergency department. It was a study about 60 people they were able to talk to and 60% of those prescriptions um, or 60% of those folks were continuing to use opiates at a one year period afterwards. Um, and 30% of folks had had uh, kind of moved forward um, to using non non medical opiates. So, you know, whether that's heroin or synthetic drugs as well at a one year period, and that was after just a one week uh, prescription in the setting of kind of a trauma that they were seeing at the emergency department for. So we're really understanding a lot more about how those even those acute periods of, uh, you know, medical prescription in the setting of the emergency department or in the setting of surgery can be really critical in, in kind of risking um, our patients having uh, pr problems with addiction down the line. So that kind of is where I find my way uh, find my way into this collaboration in Romania and the drug that they use. So for, you know, first of all, just anecdotally, I'll tell you, you know, just in chatting with the anesthesiologists that manage uh, pain there, one of the first questions they ask me is, is, how do you guys have such a problem with with opiates? Why are you prescribing so many of them? Don't you know that those are dangerous? So, you know, just incredible to just be there and interact with them and kind of hear their perspective on our problem and then also learn about how they manage pain there. So this this one unique drug kept coming up. Um, it's called metamazole. Uh, it's very unique. It has kind of overlapping, you know, some non-steroidal mechanisms with inhibition of COX-3 and some also inhibition of COX-1 and 2. But then also, the, uh, you know, these endogenous effects on endogenous opioid and endocannabinoid systems that almost puts it and, you know, mixing with different interactions, almost similar to Tylenol as well with those overlapping mechanisms in endogenous opioid and cannabinoid systems. 
And, you know, in another anecdote, one of the surgeons I was with, he go, he, he told me, uh, you know, he goes, you know, when I come in, I have back pain. I just break open a metamazol vial and that's what I use for my back pain. It's great. You know, this is what we use for everyone there. Um, interestingly, it's not available in the United States because it was banned uh, in, the in 1979 by the FDA due to concerns about agranulocytosis, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. So obviously agranulocytosis you know, we're, uh, is a risk um, with uh, you know, a variety of different medications. Um, less commonly so in the setting of kind of a pain control medication, we're more worried about that in the setting of kind of a chemotherapeutic, anything that's targeting um, you know, our, our white blood cells or our precursors to white blood cells. So agranulocytosis being you know, a significant drop in our immune cells uh, uh, level. And if we can move to the next slide, I've got a little bit more information about that as well. Um, but so kind of going back and I, you know, I ended up having to conduct a bit of this historical analysis just to see, um, kind of reflect back on that FDA um, decision that was made in 1979. And, and what I found is when we look into um, the data that was used to bolster that decision, the, the use of metamazole was actually uh, being used in cancer patients with chronic pain that were also on uh, concurrent high-dose chemotherapy. And what we know is that concurrent high-dose chemotherapy is, is likely a greater risk factor for de developing agranulocytosis than, um, than the use of this drug. Um, so uh, additionally, you know, there have been several large meta-analyses. That initial study by the FDA reported a rate of agranulocytosis somewhere in the range of 1 in 1,000, 1 in 2,000. I have 1 in 1,500 listed on the slide. Um, but there have been large meta-analyses that have uh, preceded th uh, that initial decision that have actually, you know, determined rates that, uh, that were closer to two and a half and a hundred thousand. There was even one that kind of was closer in the range of one in a million um, chance of agranulocytosis, which if you see kind of that third bullet point, that sub bullet point, um, comparing metamazole to other commonly used medications. So diclofenac commonly used in the orthopedic clinic has a rate of 592 cases per million. Aspirin, you know, commonly used has 185 in a million and then metamazole sitting at, at 25 in a million, making it very similar. You know, if you see the next point, 20 in a million for acetaminophen makes, you know, puts metamazole right in between the safety of aspirin or acetaminophen in one large meta-analysis. So it really kind of, you know, makes it seem as though, you know, our understanding of agranulocytosis then, um, you know, really might not have been appropriate and whether or not, you know, this is a viable, um, this could, you know, obviously it's being used efficaciously in Romania, as I just in other places, South America is also uh, very commonly used. And then a large analysis in Spain also found only 177 cases across 78 million person years of use. So this is a cheap drug that's non-addictive, that uh, you know, is, is highly efficacious uh, in you know, many countries across uh, the world, but we can't use the United States. So kind of the question that we asked is, well, kind of our first step would be, you know, is it effective? You know, we're seeing, we, we think maybe there's less of a concern about agranocytosis, but is it actually efficacious in pain? So that's kind of what we looked at in the setting of orthopedic surgery. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So we conducted a systematic review um, uh, using kind of the, the PRISMA uh, guidelines for systematic review. We included, we found 15 studies in the literature that we included that focused on metamazole as an analgesic in the setting of orthopedic surgery. Um, so 10 of the 15 included studies favored metamazole for analgesic efficacy compared to other non-opioids. Those included acetaminophen, uh, paracoxib, and ibuprofen. Uh, metamazole showed, uh, and importantly, um, one of the more exciting results, metamazole showed a significant decrease in rescue analgesia or opioid utilization in six of our 15 articles. And one of those studies found a 74% reduction in opioid consumption. So actually seeing a potential opioid sparing capacity of using metamazole. Uh, and then additionally, we also saw good dose response. There's a dose response study that was included in our paper where 40 milligram per kilo dose compared to a 15 uh, uh, mg per kg dose had less pain and lower supplementary morphine. So again, highlighting that opioid sparing effect. Um, no studies uh, out of all of our studies, all the 15 included, you know, almost six, 600 patients receiving metamazole report in any cases of agranulocytosis, including at those varying kind of higher dose ranges. And metamazole offered equivalent analgesia to current uh, Currently used non-opioids like I described with acetaminophen or paracoxib and ibuprofen, uh, but may offer more opioid sparing ability than other non-opioids. So the next steps that we have, we actually currently have an ongoing um, non-opioid pain study uh, out of KUMC, um, and we're having really great results there. That'll probably run for the next six months, continue to run through the next six months, and that's focused on trauma surgery, actually. So what I would describe is probably a more, more complicated uh, uh, patient load as well. 
but we've had exciting results so far with, with pain control. Um, and then we also have an ongoing additional literature review, uh, looking specifically again back at this question of adrenocytosis rate and seeing if we can pull kind of a new number, a new uh, new kind of number needed to treat for that agranulocytosis rate. Um, and kind of really to in closing, kind of the what we have envisioned is at the very least kind of thinking about, you know, these other drugs that we don't commonly use for analgesia, at the very least to have some of that opioid sparing effect really just to to make uh, this, you know, this whole idea of perioperative pain control safer for patients going forward. Uh, with that, uh, that is the end of my presentation. I just have references on the next slide. Um, happy to entertain any questions or comments. Um, and if, if folks are interested, I also have an expanded slide deck where I can send you kind of a preprint copy of the manuscript if you're, if this is something you're excited about. So thank you so much for the time.